Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Feed the Beast Revelation. Just heading down here to pick up my hammer from our auto-leveling system, which has been working beautifully, by the way. We already have two additional modifiers on our hammer and well on our way to our third. Should probably go ahead and drop the reinforcements on that so I don't have to repair it quite so often. But this little system has been working wonders. Should probably start leveling up my other tools as well. That being said, after today, our hammer isn't going to be quite as useful anymore. Or at least slightly. It's still going to be good for clearing out areas, but ideally... No, it's turning nighttime. I have the worst timing. <laughs> ideally, after today, we're not going to need to go mining as much. Because, as I mentioned last time, we want to try and get to the point where we're starting to automate things a bit more. All of this manual work that I've been doing is kind of for noobs, and we want to get past that. So today what I want to do is work on some automation. Specifically, I want to work on automating our ore gathering. At least for the first half of the episode, I have other plans for the second half. But the first thing I want to do is try and set up some system that's automatically going to gather ores for us so we don't need to go mining ourselves. Not that mining is too bad, I mean once you get to the stage of having tools like these it's actually kind of fun, but it would be nice to just get resources without having to worry about it so we can focus on cool stuff like building. So I'm going to go ahead and prepare some things because as simple as it is to actually get into this, surprisingly, it's not actually all that hard to set up something that automatically mines for you. But as simple as it is, it does take a bit of prep work. So I'm going to go ahead and get all of the resources Nessie for... Nessie. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and get all of the resources necessary for this, and then I'll meet you guys over in our mining dimension, and we'll get started. It turns out that it's kind of a bad idea to try and sleep inside of the dimensional world. Yeah. So sleep issues aside, here we are in our mining dimension, and keep in mind we don't actually need to use this place for this. The way that we're actually going to be mining ore doesn't even destroy the world, so realistically this would probably be better off over in our base area, but we have this dimension, we may as well take advantage of it. So the way that we're actually going to be mining up ore is via a mod called Environmental Tech. And that sounds very fancy, but in reality it's actually quite simplistic. It does take a few resources to get into, it does take a few stacks of iron, a few stacks of redstone, and a good chunk of diamond in order to craft everything necessary for the tier 1 void ore miner, which is what we're going to be setting up today, but it's not that hard. Once you get to the point of having some decent tools, it's one quick mining trip and you're good to go. Now, the biggest kind of obstacle for this though isn't actually the resources, it's the power generation. Because the tier 1 void ore miner does take, if I recall, about six to 700 RF per tick in order to keep it running. Now our current power generation, which is a tree oil based system we made back in episode number 2, that is more than enough to keep this powered, uh, by a good bit, by several hundred RF. So we will be fine in that regard, but... As we do things like this, as we set this up and the other thing we're going to do today, we're going to start reaching the limit, so we may want to upgrade our power gen fairly soon. Anyway, that is a problem for later on. How do we get into environmental tech? Well, the mud itself is basically divided up into six tiers based on these crystals right here. And the general idea is that you start off with the tier 1 crystal, which is litharite, and you can actually craft this one. It takes one diamond, four flint, and a couple different dyes in order to get four of these crystals, and you do need quite a few of them. And then from then on, the rest of the crystals can only be gotten from the void ore miners themselves. You cannot craft these in any way. So we're going to craft the void ore miner tier 1. And that's eventually, over a long period of time, going to give us enough erodium crystals to upgrade it to a tier 2. And then from then on, we'll start getting kyronite crystals, and you get the idea. And of course, these can also be used to upgrade other things. So there's also the resource miner, which gets stone and dirt. There's, well, and other things underground, obviously. The botanic miner, which gives things like seeds and leaves and logs, plant life type stuff. And, of course, the solar array, which is actually a power generator. It's a solar panel, essentially. And the highest tier of this is ridiculously powerful, by the way. I believe it gives something like 1.7 million RF per tick. Though, when you get to this stage, things do start getting quite expensive. The... <laughs> I don't know what resource it was. Uh, I guess it was probably the structure frames. Yeah. Each one of those takes two nether stars, and you need dozens of these blocks. So, it does get a little pricey towards the end. For right now, though, it's not too bad. So, all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and start building this bad boy. We're going to want to pillar up a couple blocks. Let's grab everything we need. 
because this is a multi-block structure and it is going to build itself down a few blocks. So we want it up a little bit, that way we can walk underneath it. That should be good. So the void or minor controller by itself isn't going to do much of anything. We need to place all of these other blocks along with it. The structure frames, the structure panels, the laser cores, and the clear lens. And you can get a list of the things you need for any particular block from environmental tech by left clicking them with this handy little assembler, which is just two obsidian and a litharite crystal. That will actually give you a list of everything that you need in order to complete the structure. So you can see over there it lists everything we need, and then it lists everything we need for the next tier as well. So that's handy, but it doesn't actually tell us what order we need to craft things in. Because this is a multi-block structure, where are we going to place all these blocks down? Well, the assembler actually handles that for us as well. If we just come up here and hold right-click while looking at the ore miner itself, it's going to automatically take those blocks out of our inventory and place them down where they need to go. So just like that, there we go. Our entire void ore miner is now in place. And we're actually most of the way done already. Now, there's a couple more things we need to do. First off, we need to put down a power source, which, hold on, let me make sure that this isn't going to send power into it quite yet. I want to hold off on that. So we'll put this down. This will transfer our power into the ore miner. And for right now, I'm just going to use a single energy cell and see how this thing does. And somewhere else alongside the ore miner, we also need to set up a storage that it can deposit the ores into. And of course, it's nighttime and I can't sleep in this dimension. Doot. <laughs> okay. So here's the ender storage. This is obviously going to link straight up to our storage system, but I don't want it to do that right away. I actually want to see how efficient this is. So I'm going to go ahead and dye one of these little identifiers on the top to blue. That means that this ender chest does not automatically connect with the one at our base. So now we can see how many ores this is really going to output on 32 million RF. So at this point, the structure itself is completely done and would be all up and running and awesome. But there is one more thing we need to do, and that is we need to dig a hole all the way down to bedrock. Now, we only need to dig this a you know one by one hole straight under the laser itself so that it can reach bedrock. I'm going to get swarmed, obviously. Come on, guys. The sword is awesome. <laughs> so I need to take care of that. I need to go all the way down to bedrock. Now, I'm going to use my hammer for this and create a 3x3, three three, mostly so it's easier to get back up. But I need to make sure I have my wand on my bar <laughs> so I don't uh, fall into lava if that happens. But we need to go all the way down to bedrock. So I'm going to take care of that quick. And then I'm going to go back up and I'm going to turn on the power and I'm going to leave our void ore miner running until it 100% drains that power. And we're going to see how many resources we really get for that and kind of go from there. So we've gone through all 32 million RF from our energy cell. And what did that get us? Well, not as crazy amounts of ore, really. It's not bad. We did get three diamonds out of it, an emerald, a few redstone, and even a couple of the erodium crystals, which are what we need to upgrade to the tier 2 void ore miner. Though, do keep in mind we need nearly two stacks of those, and we got... Two. <laughs> so that is going to be a long-term process. But realistically, this isn't too bad. Keep in mind that this is only the Tier 1 Void or Miner, and as we upgrade to the higher tiers, it's not only going to get faster and more efficient, but it's also going to give us access to the modifier blocks, which can make it even faster and more efficient still, at the expense of taking more power. So that is pretty cool. There is also one other thing we could do if we really wanted a specific type of ore, and that is to swap out the lenses. Right now I just have a clear lens on this, which just means it's going to get kind of a base level of each type of ore. But there are also all of these different colored lenses, and each one of these actually gives a slightly higher yield of a specific kind of ore. So if we were to put a cyan lens in, for example, we would actually get slightly more diamond than normal. Now, I'm not actually sure if that's just added, or if that would lower the rates of everything else slightly. I'm not entirely sure how it works. I assume that everything else would go down just a little bit and we would get more diamond as a result, but I should probably look into that and I should probably honestly put some kind of lens on here. The diamond one would probably be kind of nice, but I'll think about it and I'll deal with that later on. Now, even though this doesn't seem like a crazy amount of ore, because I do get hundreds of ore just from going mining for an hour, so even though this doesn't seem like a crazy amount, if we have this running passively, if we get our power gen actually hooked up to this properly, and this is just always going, this is probably going to overflow our storage system pretty quickly. 
because if this is going as long as I've had my power gen, for example, because our power gen has been basically completely full since before episode three. So if all of that time it was left running and just keeping this thing going, we would have a bajillion ore by now. So <laughs> that should be fine. If we do have enough time at the end of today's episode, we'll try and sort out our power system and get some kind of power distribution going and try and get this hooked up straight to our power gen. But we'll have to see how things go. Before we do that, there's one other project I want to take care of, and that is to get some automated mob drops going. So before we go ahead and start work on our new mob system, we are going to need to get our hands on a new material type, and that is plastic from Industrial Foregoing. Now, if you're not familiar with Industrial Foregoing, it's essentially the spiritual successor to a mod called Mine Factory Reloaded. Essentially, it's a bunch of different machine blocks that do a huge variety of very, very useful things. There's blocks that will break blocks and place blocks. There's ones that will automatically tend to your crops for you so you can automate crop farming. There's ones that will automate animal stuff that will kind of breed your animals for you or kill them for you. There's one that you can cram a villager into and automate his trades. All kinds of really cool and fancy stuff. And our mob system is actually going to be very much dependent on a couple different blocks from Industrial Foregoing. Now the issue here is that pretty much all of the blocks in Industrial Foregoing require plastic. And, well, we need to get our hands on it. Now thankfully this isn't a particularly difficult process. It is one that we're probably going to want to automate later on and maybe even do something really cool with. I have a few ideas in mind. But for right now, we're going to go ahead and just set up the most basic system we possibly can. And I've prepped the area a little bit for this. So first up, we're going to need to place down a tree fluid extractor. Let's go ahead and rotate that around. So this works much like the arboreal extractor that we used in our power generation system several episodes ago. And basically, all we have to do is pop down a piece of wood in front of it, and this is going to start pulling in fluid latex. Now this latex, we can then pipe out into a block called the latex processing unit, which needs to take power, water, and latex. And that, once we hook it up, which we can go ahead and do, boop, like a so. That is going to start turning that into tiny dry rubber. Nine of these tiny dry rubber will turn into one regular dry rubber, and then we can just smelt that, and that's going to give us the plastic. So that's all this is going to take. This does actually break the log block. It generates enough to make, I believe, two plastic each time, but then it does use up the wood in its place. So unlike the arboreal extractor, we can't just set this up in one spot and leave it forever. We could set up a system to automatically place blocks when this one breaks, but... I'll save that for the future, because I do actually want to do something cool with this. For the time being, though, this is going to do its thing. Eventually, we're going to have enough here to make two plastic, and I'll place down another log to make two more, and then we'll have enough for the machines we need for our mob farm. Now, our mob farm itself is actually going to go down here, near our automatic tool leveling system. I think this wall right here is going to be a perfect spot for it. But obviously, a mob farm does take a little bit more prep than, you know, a system like this one did. So I'm going to go ahead and clear out an area and prepare this room for what our mob farm is going to be. And I'll be back with you guys once we're ready to slap all the machines in and get this thing running. So here is our mob farming room. Pretty basic, but I think it'll get the job done just fine, even if it is just a little box with some lights in it. Though we can automatically turn the lights on and off, because obviously that is important for a mob farm. Can you guess where the light switch is? It's this torch. So this is a torch lever from the Secret Rooms mod, and I'm really glad I discovered this, because that mod is actually really, really cool. You can make things like the torch lever, you can make buttons that look like full blocks, you can hide pressure plates in blocks, you can hide doors inside of blocks, you can make one-way glass, you can make trap doors that are hidden around their surroundings, lots of cool stuff like that. So it's a very, very handy mod to keep in mind. Anyway, moving on to our mob farm. Now, I'm going to try and go through this stuff relatively quickly, just so it doesn't take 20 minutes to cover all of it. If I skip through anything a little bit too fast, feel free to ask questions down below, and I'll do my best to help you out. Anyway... 
Now that we have our area for mob farming, how are we actually going to spawn mobs in here? Because obviously just turning this into a dark room would not be particularly effective. Well, we're actually going to use a block called a mob duplicator from Industrial Foregoing. And the way that this block works, we're going to go ahead and pop this down in the middle of our room, is it takes in a bit of power, it takes in some fluid essence, or liquefied XP, basically, and it also takes in a mob imprisonment tool, and that shows it what mob that it should be duplicating. And then it'll just start churning out the mobs, as long as it has those three things. Very, very handy, and it actually spawns them inside of a 9x9x5 area. So you can see it fills up pretty much the entire room, and it's just going to spawn anything we put in there in that radius. So that is very, very cool. Now we need a way to kill the mobs that are coming from the mob duplicator, and for that we're going to use the mob crusher. So we're going to place this down, we want to spin that around because we do want the grindy bits pointing forward. And this is just going to automatically kill anything inside of a 7x7x3 area in front of it, just like a so. So anything inside of this area will automatically get killed, it'll take a bit of RF and it will automatically pick up the XP from those mobs, turn that into fluid essence. You can see how this is going to work now. And it also automatically picks up their items, and we can pipe those out wherever we want to. So that's all well and good, but these two blocks by themselves are not self-sufficient. The mobs spawned in by the duplicator don't give as much essence back as they took to spawn, and that means that we need another source of the fluid essence if we're going to keep this system running. So essentially that means we need more mob spawning. And the best way to do that, as far as I'm aware, is the use of something called a drop of evil. This is a drop you get from Wither Skeletons, and it has a few different uses. You can also use it to do stuff with spawners, actually. But what we're going to do here is use it on our dirt. Now, do keep in mind you need to be very careful when you do this, because when you click a dirt, or grass, or any type of dirt, really, it does this. Now, this is Cursed Earth, and this stuff spawns in mobs whenever it's dark, and it does so very quickly, and it spawns in very, very nasty mobs. It spawns in kind of cursed versions of zombies and creepers and spiders, and they move around super duper quick, they hit you really fast. You really want to make sure you don't accidentally let this stuff leak out where you don't want it to be, because it does sneak around. If I had dirt through the corners, for example, it would find its way out, and then I would have mobs spawning where I don't want them to be. So do keep that in mind, it is really, da really dangerous. So, at this point we have all of our mob spawning set up and our mob killing set up, but we have a bit of an issue, and that's that all of the mobs need to be inside of this area in order to actually get killed. And that means that any that spawn outside of here could linger around for a long time, and we don't want that. So we're going to move those into the middle automatically using vector plates. So these are essentially like conveyor belts, and if I'm not holding shift and I get on these, it's going to fling me forward, as you can see. So, these don't even block spawning, so essentially this means that anything that spawns inside of this room, outside of the killing field, is automatically going to get pushed into it, and that means that everything should be dying very, very quickly, and our system should be very, very efficient. So that is brilliant. Now once we have all of these in place, the room itself is pretty much done, and we just need to hook everything up, and get everything running. So there we go, that's all of that in place. Now we need to hook up the duplicator and the crusher and get all of the logic for the system going. And in order to do that, we're going to use a mod called XNet. So XNet is kind of like the advanced version of the thermal dynamics pipes and ducts that we've used in the past to transfer items and fluids and power. But instead of doing that with a bunch of different pipes for different types, we can do that with a single cable using XNet. So we pop down a connector on top of the block we want to interface with, and then we connect them all together using cables like us so. And yes, we are making quite a mess out of our base area. I am going to have to try and come out here and fix that up. Hopefully I'll be able to do that yet today. But for now, we're just going to get everything up and running. So bring the cable on down here, and we're going to pull this all the way over to a little hidden room underneath the area next to our mob farm. So if we come up here, this is that secret trap door, and there's our mob system. So we'll be able to come down here anytime we want to turn the system on or off, or just play around with the logic or fix something. You get the idea. So now we need to interface with our mob crusher up here. So we need another connector. And we also need a controller from XNet. This is going to be the brains of the operation and determines how everything gets sent around. Another connector down here because we need to connect to our energy cell. And let's see, two more connectors because we need to connect to a trash can because we do want to discard certain types of items that we don't want piling up in our inventories and an ender chest to send the items we do want into our main storage system. 
So that's all well and good. We're also going to apply a filter to the trash can, and we'll sort that out in a little bit. And let's actually go ahead and transform the ender chest into a different channel. So this now will not automatically link to our storage system because I want to see how fast the drops are. So at this point, everything is set up. We just need to hook up our XNet system. Now I realize this does look probably a little intimidating if you're not familiar with it, but in reality, it's actually quite simple. So up here we have different channels and we can create different channels to handle different things. So for example, energy. Here's a channel that's going to transfer all of our power for us. And all we have to do is determine which of these blocks need the power sent to them or pulled from them. So our energy cell, for example, we can go ahead and set a channel that will extract from this. So now the XNet cable will automatically pull power out of there. And now we can just define what channels we want it to go into. So we want some to go into our crusher. We want some to go into our duplicator. And we also want some to go into the controller itself because that does need a little bit of power. And there we go. That is our entire power system set up. Now we could go ahead and add one in for items. So that's going to extract from the crusher. Going to extract. We're going to want that to be a stack at a time so it can keep up. And we want to input those into both the trash can and the ender chest. And because we're going to be filtering the trash can, it should work just fine like that. And last thing we need to do is transfer a bit of liquid. And I passed it. There we go. So for fluids, we need to extract from the crusher, extract, and we need to insert into the duplicator, just like so. And with that, our entire XNet system is good to go. In fact, I'm going to disable these channels temporarily, just so this doesn't get going when I don't want it to. I do actually need to supply it with a little bit of power straight to the controller, just to get that up and running. And that should be plenty. And now, our system is good to go. Once I turn those channels back on, everything should start running, at least once I turn the lights off. But we do still have a couple other problems we want to address first. First, we want to be able to access this room, because we do want to be able to change out the mob imprisonment tool that we put into the duplicator, because we're going to want to swap out for different mobs when we want different resources. Now, I could automate this process using XNet, but honestly, that's kind of cumbersome compared to just walking in here and swapping out the tool. So... I'm probably not going to go that route. Instead, what I think we're going to do is just make it so we can get in here and swap it out. Now, we do have one other problem, and that's, well, this giant gaping hole. <laughs> Obviously, this is not a good thing to have on the side of a mob farm. That is just a recipe for disaster. Now, that does lead to a couple other problems, though, because one, I want to be able to see in here. Even though it is going to be pitch black and we're not going to be able to see very well, I do like the idea of being able to see into the mob farm and have it running. But that, of course, also means that light would be able to get through. So we need a way to see in here, we need a way to walk into here, but we also need to block all of the light from getting into the farm itself. So in order to do that, we're actually going to make a block called dark glass. It's relatively simple to make. You just need to mix some sand and some glass together, smelt that up, and then you get a special type of glass from Extra Utilities. You mix that with some dye and you get dark glass. This is a special form of glass that will block out all light, but still allow you to see through it. So that solves half of our problem, but we still have the issue of not being able to get in. We can fix that, however, using something called Dark Ineffable Glass, which is an upgraded version of it. So if we put eight dark glass around a moonstone, which is a diamond surrounded by this lunar dust from Extra Utilities, and you get that by putting lapis into a resonator, that's going to give you the Dark Ineffable Glass. And essentially what this does is the same thing as dark glass. It blocks out all light and still allows you to see through, but it allows the player, and only the player, to walk through it. And that solves all of our problems and works beautifully. I appear to have a little XP bar stuck to my hand for some reason. I'm not entirely sure what that's all about. <laughs> but other than that, we do have our entire mob system in place. We've got our ineffable glass that we can walk through. We can put stuff into our duplicator without any trouble. We can go and turn all of this on and it would start working right now. Except for one critical part of it. You see, the mob duplicator, as I explained earlier, needs a mob imprisonment tool. And I don't have any of those. <laughs> kind of overlooked that earlier on. So the imprisonment tool is not too hard to make. It only takes four plastic, which isn't terribly difficult. But it does also take a ghast tier. Now, I only have one of these, if that. I might have zero. And that's kind of a problem, because I do want several of these today, because I do want to go and try and capture some useful mobs, just to have them on hand, if I need things like ender pearls or blaze rods, or 
prismarine. You get the idea. So I'm going to go ahead and go on a bit of a ghast hunting trip in order to make several of these imprisonment tools, and then we're going to run around and gather some mobs quick, and then we're going to come back and actually make sure that our mob system even works. So we are pretty much good to go on our mob system now. We have our mob imprisonment tools, which I'm keeping down here in a chest so they're conveniently located. I got a ghast, a wither skeleton, a blaze, an enderman, a guardian, and just for fun, an elder guardian as well, since I was in the ocean monuments already. I'm not even sure if that's actually going to work with this system, but we'll see, I suppose. Now, I did technically already try out our mob spawning system. Because I didn't feel like hunting ghasts for an hour, I actually brought the first ender pearl back, crafted it into an imprisonment tool, and then captured a second ghast and used that to get the ghast tiers to make the rest of these. So I already know that this works. It seemed to work pretty well, in fact. But let's go ahead and grab one of these. Uh, let's actually try the Elder Guardian, just for fun. So all we need to do is hop up here, walk in, pop this into our mob duplicator. And now what we need to do is turn all of our channels back on. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Just like so. And now we need to turn the lights off. And we already have mobs spawning in and dying. And the incredible thing about this is that this doesn't... Oh, the other guardians do work. <laughs> the incredible thing about this is that it's very loud. Yeah, but it's also that this will spawn mobs super quick at any point. Uh, it's actually nighttime right now. You can see in the top right of our screen it's night according to Journey Map. So our entire area up above is unlit. We have mobs spawning all over up there. But the Cursed Earth seems to have its own mob cap, so it spawns stuff just constantly. And of course our mob duplicator doesn't care about the mob cap at all. So this system is going to run all the time at like full capacity. And just from how long we've already had this on, this is what we're getting. Including solidified experience, which is a nice bonus. That means we get free additional XP for ourselves, which is always cool. We're getting Prismarine. Obviously, we could put regular Guardians in there and get more of that. Uh, even some wet sponges, which I guess is logical, given the whole Elder Guardian thing. We do need to filter out stuff like bows and armor. So let me actually grab... This is probably going to, well, this is going to destroy items for a little bit while I do this. But let's go ahead and set up our filter here. Going to go ahead and ignore NBT and ignore metadata. And now if we pop this in here, the bows and, and golden boots should automatically get destroyed. And we can add a few more things to that filter as well. I'm guessing these got in ahead of time. Hopefully we don't see any more. And I suppose we could also throw these in there. Did any more get through? Now a golden helmet gets through. <laughs> I'm going to have to deal with this for a little while, uh, putting in individual armor pieces. I assume that it doesn't matter if they're enchanted or not, since we have those ignore tags on. But once I have all of the armor and stuff set into that filter, we shouldn't have to worry about that getting into our storage system. The rest of the stuff, though, is going to be able to pipe directly into our storage and probably fill it up relatively quickly, based on how quick this seems to be going. But that is pretty awesome. So our mob system seems to be a success. Later on down the road, we're probably going to want to build something a lot cooler than this. Something much more robust and like super duper crazy. Even though this does seem to work really well, I do want to build some kind of like factory or something where we can process mobs. So that should be pretty fun. But for the time being, this is going to serve as a really good way of getting resources from mobs when we need them. Now, we'll see if we need to get specific ones for like creepers, for example. Oh no, he lasted long enough to give me mining fatigue. What a guy. <laughs> But, I mean, we do already have like half a stack of gunpowder and well over half a stack of bones just from the Cursed Earth spawning. 
So I don't know that we'll need one specifically for like creepers or skeletons, but it'll be easy enough to get those if we do need them. So for the time being, I think that's fine. Now for today though, I think I'm going to have to call it here. The video I suspect is getting relatively long at this point. I would like to try and sort out our power situation so we have wireless power transmission instead of putting in energy cells, though this system really doesn't drain power all that much. Uh, keep in mind I did have this running a little bit earlier like I said as well, and we're only down about a million and a half RF so far, so it does last a good while on an energy cell, but I would prefer it to be wireless. There is a relatively easy way we can do that, but we're going to have to wait until next time for that. Now next time, if we do take care of that, it'll be right away at the beginning. And then I'm going to try and move on and take care of something a little bit more interesting, because we've been doing the technical kind of slow stuff for the last couple episodes. We'll probably try and get back to building next episode as our main thing, especially now that we have access to a couple specific resources that I wanted to get my hands on. But we'll deal with that then. For today, I'm going to call it here. So, uh, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed our little mob farm project and our void ore miner and whatnot, even if it's not the most exciting of stuff to do. And, well, like I said, next time we'll try and get into building. So, thank you guys for watching, have an amazing day, and I'll see you then.